Welcome to Outlaw Gamer Radio, the official podcast of OutlawGamers.com. This is the show where we live to play and play to live. I'm Brent Adams, joined by Mr. Lauren Baumgarten for this, our 2015 Game of the Year episode. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you for having me, Brent. <laughs> well, you know, it is it is your show also, so <laughs> I suppose in hindsight, it's not much of a... It's really not much of a guest. You're, you're really not much of a guest, and it really wasn't much of an invitation. It was. It That's was, actually it was not the like, first time I've heard those words. Yeah, I bet. I was just about to mention your wife. Uh, it's kind of <laughs> like your wife leaving a note for you saying, "Hey, how'd you like to uh, how'd you like to use the bathroom?" And you're kind of like, "I was going to do that anyway." <laughs> Thanks. That is a uh, oddly that image uh, will haunt specific. Me. <laughs> note, Brent. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should talk after the show. Maybe we shouldn't. Uh, uh, how are you, thought. my friend? How are you? I'm excited to do a 2015 uh, Game of the Year episode. Well, I- I'm doing very well. Neither of us are doing well, uh, doing as well as Star Wars: The Force Awakens, which today uh, beat out Jurassic Park for the uh, the opening weekend global box office. So it's now snagged opening like Thursday preview. Records with like 57 million, uh, single day and Friday records with 119.1 million or something like that. Sunday records with 60 million, uh, domestic box office with 257 million, I think, and then international box office with 529. That's right, easily beat out Jurassic Park. But to be fair, Brent, it did not beat out its more adult, uh, um, to be fair, Brent. It did not beat out its more adult peer, Jurassic Pork. Yes. Actually, still has, still holds a record. Listen, but I mean, like that, that will never be dethroned, you know? <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, so yeah. God, I, I guess, wish we could talk about Star Wars, but I believe. Well, I just was going to say congratulations to Disney. I mean, you know, they bought, they bought Lucasfilm for $4 billion and they made back 25% of their investment in the last three days. So congratulations to Disney. They, <laughs> not quite, but they will, no question about it. Star Wars cost, <laughs> I think I saw that it costs $350 million to make. That's a lot. Uh, that's and, that's and, more than I would have expected. That's a lot it, of money. It, less than Grand Theft Auto Five. Yeah, crazy. Uh, but it. But uh, well, that's a good it, point. Uh, yeah, it uh, it made back obviously a couple hundred million in the first weekend, and by the time it goes international and well, it, you know, I mean it's all profit. The, at the this long point. tail sales, they, they'll make back that that close to. I bet you they make close to that couple billion dollars. Yeah, it, it's it's uh, well, if if they get into that territory, then they might they might take Avatar. Um, but anyway, yeah, pretty uh, pretty impressive performance, particularly given the fact that the film doesn't even open in China until January uh, 9th or something like that. Yeah, and for those of you that actually would like to talk, I'd love to talk about it here, but yeah. uh, Brent, you and Tony did a drive-home breakdown, did you not? We did. That'll be out later this week if you want to hear our our raw and unfiltered reactions to Star Wars The Force Awakens. <laughs> Mere moments. <laughs> Which is literally 90 minutes of them going, yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's it, the unfiltered reaction. That, that's 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 basically it. You'd be surprised actually how hard it is to do that show sometimes. Like to actually gather your thoughts and turn it into something cohesive uh, is actually more difficult than we thought it would be. Uh, and we, and we're lazy by nature, which is probably why we don't do more shows, <laughs> which makes it exponentially more difficult. And speaking of not doing shows, let's stop not doing this show and start doing it. And speaking of not doing oh, shows, we just want to segue. Yeah, we want to remind everybody that next week uh, we are taking off for the holidays, so there will not be a show. Yeah. Uh, next week on Tuesday, the what is it, 29th, I believe. Uh, no show next week. This will be the last show of the year, the game of the year episode. And then we'll be back the first week of January with a br- bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, fresh new episode uh, for you guys to listen to. So yeah, and listen, that, just Brent, so you guys know, that is the 29th. Lauren was right about that. I know. That, I know. We <laughs> don't like to assume. Anything, Anything on this show, but uh, anyway. With that, Brent, should we jump into this year's episode of, this is where you insert the music, dun dun dun, dun game of the year. <laughs> dun dun, dun dun, dun, oh, okay, hang on, hang on, hang on. <laughs> now I don't even give a shit about the show. Now I just want to hear. Yeah, me too. We we, uh, we should just stop recording this, and we should just like stay on Skype on our phones and go, <laughs> go catch watch Star, Star Wars, Wars right now. Um, uh, oh yeah, our game of the year show. Right, right, right. Wah, wah. Game of the year show. Um, <laughs> all right, Brent. So my game of the year. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, wait, no foreplay? <laughs> just kidding. Here's your foreplay. So uh, this year we're using a similar format to what we did last year, which is we're going to talk 
um, about a, a few different things besides just our game of the year. We're going to talk about some of the remasters that came out this year, some indie games, mm. some of the wish wish it would have come out, uh, <laughs> most disappointing most, stuff. That's most things. Yeah, right? Um, best games I didn't play, that kind of thing. And then we'll right. get uh, a little bit later, further down the show. We'll talk about our games of the year. Okay, Brent. that's true. That's uh, true. And then follow it up or end the show with uh, our anticipated. most anticipated games yeah, for next year of 2016. Right. So, well, let's start off with the games that came out this year that we already played last year because they were remasters. All right. Yes. Which is an interesting category because there's some legitimately good stuff in here. Uh, of course, you've been playing Uncharted: The Nathan Drake Collection recently. Yeah. Uh, there was, let's see, Journey, one of our favorite games of all time. Which looks in- incredible on the PS4. Yeah, and it's not like Journey looked bad on the PS3. No. Uh, let's see, Tearaway Unfolded, Divinity Original Sin Enhanced Edition, Beyond Two Souls, which I was... That was an interesting litmus test for me, because I always thought I would want to go back and play Beyond Two Souls, and I thought when I heard about the remaster, I thought, oh, that'll be the perfect... Uh, perfect opportunity turns out i guess i don't want to play beyond two souls again <laughs> so i didn't but still good on them and then let's see what else we got on the list here limbo limbo and ah, that's, that's a good uh, that's a good one as well and this is Excellent we should title. i should say brent like with the remasters and the indie games these are not obviously complete lists there are many 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 more remasters there's gonna we're gonna talk about certainly four or five indies games but there's many many more indie games so these aren't all of them but but these are just some notables st- <laughs> these are some big ones there continues yeah. to be a lot of uh remasters uh in this current generation of consoles i know it's it's almost like it's almost like the game industry figured out a way to get people to give them money twice for the same thing and then they just kept doing it over and over. I mean, it's and over and, and over. over. And, and 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 did you see? Seriously, it's a, it's a very very. I mean, good on them. It's a fantastic business model. When you don't have to, when all you have to basically invest in is the translation of a game, you know, from sort of one console generation to the next or whatever, where you don't have to reinvent the entire wheel, and you can you know keep selling it to people. You know, obviously that's working out very well for them. Well, and you know what? Actually, Brent, to, to, so a couple of things. Number one, Divinity, Divinity Original Sin actually shouldn't necessarily be on here. It's not a remaster. It wasn't out on the previous consoles. It was a PC game that okay. eventually yes. Yes. was ported. So that's ma- that, that one maybe shouldn't be on there. But um, did you buy any of these, by the way, this year? No. The only one that I was really, really tempted by was the Uncharted Nathan Drake collection. Mm-hmm. And like many things in the bottom half of the year, I haven't bought it simply because I know that I won't play it. Right. Um, did you journey was a, a PS plus it was. Yeah. And I, and actually I thought that there was supposed to be a way to, if you already own journey to be able to get it for free, but oh, maybe, maybe that's what it was. I'm sorry. Maybe it wasn't a PS plus. Maybe I can't remember, but it was a, if you already own it, you get it for free. And I think that's how I got it. Yeah. But I like, I missed the window or something. Cause when I went to like download, or maybe there was some procedure that I was ignorant of, but I haven't gotten it for free. And so I figured I'll just wait because I figure on a long enough timeline, they'll give that away one of these months for PSN and then I'll they get absolutely it. will. Did you go, did you go and look and it wasn't available for free? Yeah. But uh, like I said, it, it mm. was, it was well after it had been right released. So I may have just yeah, missed yeah. a window of opportunity, but some great games, some absolutely great games. Um, sure. Uh, for remasters. And as I said, that list could be much longer And then coming up. We have, I know at least on the, the, there's actually been a little bit of controversy, you know, very recently about coming up sooner the like the PlayStation two remasters. Yeah, yeah, very uh, true. that apparently they're charging between ten and fifteen bucks for, uh, and some people may be a little unhappy about that price point, thinking it's a little too much for a PlayStation Two game. I, I think so. I mean, I, I think that there's, I think that there's maybe a few pay- PlayStation Two games that might be important enough to me to get at that price point, but very, very few. I, I, I would have to say that if most people feel that strongly about it, that price will get adjusted downward because, because uh, nobody will pay for it. I would I would agree with that. All right, Brent. So let's move over to just again. It's, it's a shortened category. Indie games. We're just talking about some of the great indie games that came out this year. These aren't necessarily all the best ones. They're just some sort of more prominent ones. Yeah. Um, ones that stand out to me, Brent. Life is Strange um, is one that has been just getting a ton of attention. Uh, the five episode game yep. uh, where you play the uh, girl who's in high school. This is getting a ton of attention on Outlaw Gamers, and rightfully uh, so. That, Indeed, it, rightfully it, it so. It looks really cool. Um, Rocket League, of course. Um, Rocket League is maybe the success story of the year. 
Like it's amazing how like like honestly I I mean like it's like two games that I've not really played all that much but like when I think about 2015 in gaming it's hard to ignore things like Rocket League and Ark you know just like these sort of off the beaten path mega hits uh, that have really really captured people's attention. I saw a post recently on Outlaw Gamers stating that um, uh, Rocket League I think has made 50 million dollars to this point. Jesus Christ. Yeah, which is is huge, that's and it's crazy. it's a phenomenal, phenomenal game. It's I mean, it is fantastically fun. I and mean, that's the thing about Rocket League that you can say that game is every inch as fun as everyone says it is. Yep, that's a true story. Uh, everybody's gone to the Rapture, uh, a big game that I hated. Yeah, you know um, that one is interesting because that one has gotten the attention. I mean, I've had not just one, but a a couple, three. I can think of three of my friends who are not really gamers who have all mentioned that game to me. It's interesting. Really? It's interesting uh, how how that game, for whatever reason, seems to have evoked some interest in in people outside gaming. And and they they told me it's like you know I don't really like video games, but I, like I think maybe IO Nine or somebody like you know like one of those Gawker websites uh, did something on it, and maybe that's where they saw it. Uh, but uh, you know they're like, I'm not really a gamer, but that game looks really interesting to me. And I said, well, that's probably because you're not really a gamer, and it's not really a game. Um- <laughs> <laughs> Two others, Brett, that I want to mention. Uh, Trine 3. Kicking it in the kidneys. Just try, well, three others, actually. Trine 3 came yeah. out. Trine's a great series. I have not played Trine 3, but I do want to mention it. Grow Home, uh, very I, popular on the PSN. Yeah, I haven't checked that one out yet either. Yeah, neither have I yet. And then, of course, uh, normally we wouldn't re- or, you know necessarily uh, talk about this in 2015 because the game actually came out in 2014. But we got to give some love to our boys at White Paper Games. Uh, James Burton and uh, the PS4 disc based version of Ether One of Ether One. No, not just not just disc based, but PS4 version and a disc based version. Yes, it, uh, and of in Ether addition one, so. to that, it's also in in our case an autographed disc based version, which is very <laughs> nice. And and yes, yes, th- there that is how cheap we are. All you have to do is send us a copy of your game autographed, and you will get a mention on this show. <laughs> that's well, that's true, but really. Uh, all you have to do is make a game and be an outlaw gamer, and and we'll mention it on that's the show. That's true. So. It, we're far cheaper than that, even. But that's exactly but that right. Is, that um, is a fantastic game, and wasn't it on? It was a PSN game this year, right? Correct. Yeah. 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 So I, I guess you know, there's there's some validity. I mean, we've got GTA Five on PC on this list, so that's just as valid. So yeah, um, either one. And as a matter of, and you know, it's ironic you mentioned that because everybody who uh, mentioned everybody's gone to the rapture to me, I said, yeah, fuck that game. You ought to go play Ether One. That's the game you ought to be playing. Yeah. So those are some of the indie games we want to call out. Another great year for indie game. There's plenty of them, uh, but uh, we just wanted to call those out. We do have a section, Brent, called uh, the next section up is called "Wish It Would Have Come Out." <laughs> this section uh, gets longer every year we do this, and this show. It's funny because this actually mimics. So when we get down to most anticipated for 2015, yeah. you'll see that several of these are in the wish it would have come out uh, category. Our most the, these were I directly copied over our most anticipated left from right, last from year. From last year, yeah. Uh, games we wish would have come out. No Man's Sky. Yeah, uh, I definitely would like to play that, but I, I I don't know. Like I'm I'm content to wait on it, and maybe it's just because of the way that they've marketed it. But um, I'm I'm not frothing at the mouth for it. I'm very, very eager to check that out when it's finally ready. How about Uncharted 4, A Thief's End? That one I want to play like right now. <laughs> yeah, that that, uh, one, that one I'm missing. What about, do you think, Brent, are you interested, you wish would have come out this year, Red, Demption, Red, Red, Red Dead Redemption 2? I don't know, man. I mean, it's it's hard for me to, it's hard for me to feel as excited about a game that they haven't even confirmed yet, you know? It's hard for no, me. No, no, actually, I don't know. That will be on my list for I wish it would have come out every year. Well, no, I mean, from now until the end of time. Don't mistake me. It's not that I'm saying like I won't lose my potatoes when they finally. And listen, an Irish man claiming to lose their potatoes, it means something different that you guys can't understand. I right? feel like you're a fair weather fan at this point. Anyway, my point is that um, <laughs> when when they announce Red Dead Redemption Two, I'll lose my mind undoubtedly. But I guess I just feel like. Maybe it's a defense mechanism. Like maybe I'm trying to protect myself from getting too worked up about something that I am not positive is going to happen. So I don't, don't know. Don't say. Don't ever say that. Don't ever say that again. All right, Tom Clancy's The Division is going to be a great game, Lauren. Don't you agree? <laughs> so that I put that on the wished it would have come out list, Brent, because I think it's been on our most anticipated for the last two years. Not, and I, I thought it was interesting. Not next and it was year. on our. 
I, I what's that? Not next year. I, I think I, I I was interested in the fact that this was in our wished it would have come out list and our most anticipated, and now for me it's absolutely a hundred percent not. Could we make a list? Would there be would there be enough games to populate a list called? I wish it would have been what they originally said it was going to be before we found out that was total bullshit, and the game will actually resemble <laughs> that in no way I bet, whatsoever. I bet we absolutely could. Could, could we create populate a category that list. like that and just fill? It I with, think we could, and just fill it with Watch Dogs, The Division, and other Ubisoft fails. That's. I think we could. <laughs> um, um, all right, so that's our wish. It would have come out, Brent. Uh, hopefully. Uh, no Man's Sky Uncharted Four will be coming out in 2016. Yeah, Maybe we'll get lucky. Those I feel pretty confident about. I, I if we get an announcement of Red Dead Redemption next year, yep. I'll count Maybe we'll get lucky and get a Red Dead announcement. I'll count myself lucky. All right, uh, Brett. Next up, we have uh, most disappointing. Yeah, which uh, basically have a- all of these except Just Cause Three are incorrect. They are the incorrect you, answer to this. Question. You are uh, you are you haven't put anything on here. Did you have any disappointing games this year? No, but that's mostly owing to the fact that I didn't play that many games this year. And the games I did play, I was reasonably satisfied with. That's that's great though. That's the way it should be. Yeah, I, I guess so. For me, the most disappointing. Uh, I have three games on the most disappointing list. Two of which are actually. In my top games of the year. It's interesting the way that works with you. Uh, that's not... You, well, you, you are a like, multifaceted man, Mr. Bond. That's exactly true. These are both... So, uh, so first of all, among my most disappointing games, Metal Gear Solid Five, Which is the incorrect um, answer, but keep talking. Which is, I mean, obviously, that's... that's uh, I, you know, you're not going to agree with that, and I wouldn't anticipate it no, was. No, I think. I uh, yeah, which is... I mean, I, I think I was just anticipating a very different game, and maybe I will feel differently... When I go back to it, but it just the, the game was. Let me just stop you there. For, You're never going to go back to it. For me, the maybe one day. For me, the if not if for no other reason, just to get a few more hours out of it. Um, no, that's very different. I actually enjoyed most of Deus Ex, but and yet um, never finished it. That's true. Uh, well, I didn't say I was going to finish Metal Gear Solid. So for me, the big problem with Metal Gear Solid Five that made it the, the, more, one of the most disappointing games of the year for me is I really expected. Um, something more akin to Metal Gear Solid Four. Yeah. Uh, something that was more linear and sort of story driven. Yep. Uh, not that I didn't know it was an open world game. I just didn't expect it to be what felt to me in the seven and a half hours that I played it. It was emerging narrative. That uh, yeah, emerging narrative. I, I, from my experience, is putting it generously. <laughs> um, w- what felt like um almost no narrative and really just a set of different mission parameters in different areas and. Yeah. Um, it was very different from what I anticipated, and therefore it was was pretty disappointing to me. It can. I, um, I mean, your expectations can absolutely affect your ability to, you know, to to, to appreciate something. If you want something yep. different than what you get, it's hard to come back from that in some cases. And I think I think that um, you'll see in the three games that that I have on this list that Metal Gear Solid Five was unquestionably a disappointing game to me because it was not what I was expecting. Right. Um, not because it was a poorly made game or a bad game, but because it was not what I was expecting, and therefore, to me, was disappointing. I got gotcha. you. All right. The other two games on this list, Just Cause Three and Battlefront, yeah, you were, uh, you were... both of which are on my game amongst my games of the year. Mm-hmm. Um, both of them are are uh, most disappointing for me because they are so good uh, and fundamentally broken. Um, yeah. and and in that context, so so Just Cause Three, I've talked plenty about it. Um, it, it, uh, when the game was released, it was quite literally unplayable, uh, on the PS4. The load times were so long, um, and the frame rate, they have since fixed that, but the frame rate drop is so low during any kind of explosion, which is the core mechanic of the game, uh, that the two of them together rendered the game essentially unplayable for me. And I stopped playing after a couple of days of trying, um, Battlefront also entirely at this point, unplayable, um, but uh, for a different reason, fantastically playable at the beginning, absolutely loved it. And I, I, I don't know at this point if it's because... Until they um, jacked it up. The update, or if literally people just aren't playing it anymore. But I cannot find a game to join. I, ca- I literally cannot find a game to join in the servers. What I get on every couple days, try three or four different game modes and watch the ticker go from... Looking at full servers, looking at 80% full servers, looking at 60% full servers, looking at 40% full servers, looking at 20% full servers, yeah. and then it puts me in a server with me and one other person, and we <laughs> sit there and wait. Uh, 
and, and I check multiple game modes over multiple days over multiple weeks. Yeah. And there's no one there. So it's essentially it's it is a multiplayer only game for all intents and purposes. There is single player stuff there. So um, you you have paid sixty dollars. You didn't buy the season pass yet, thank God. No. Nope. Um you you paid sixty dollars or I guess fifty because it was on the PC, wasn't it? Yeah. So fifty bucks. No, it's, I think it's fifty nine ninety nine. Okay, so I can't remember. Whatever it is, uh, y- you paid full price for a game that is now unplayable due to no action whatsoever on your part. Correct, and I, I, I think it's because of, I think there's a matchmaking malfunction yeah. that they have admitted to and said they are going to address. But for weeks, I haven't been able to play the game, and so they better address game- with the money, is what I'm saying. <laughs> I mean, it, so that game uh, and Just Cause 3 are on my most disappointing because they're essentially technically fucked. Yeah. And they're unplayable. <laughs> yeah. um, and they're both really good games, but I can't play either one of them. They're both really great games when they work, which is yeah. not yep. often. So so there you go. Those are my most disappointing, Brent. All right. Uh, the most disappointing category, uh, I feel like you kind of didn't put anything on there, so it would just be the Jewish guy whining about... <laughs> <laughs> Big disappointed, but whatever. That's cool. You know, I don't know. Uh, I mean, that's the thing. I like. I just, you know, I didn't. I don't know. I didn't play enough this year. Like, I didn't. And it's just maybe because I'm becoming so much more um, uh, judicious with my time. Yep. But uh, I just didn't. I didn't play anything that I didn't have a, a, a relative level of certainty about. You know, I just didn't. And so that's great. For years, you've been playing a bunch of shit because you do this show. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and now, and now, be really selective. But having um, your daughter is allowing you to actually play just good games and have a very positive. It, it, it's worked out okay in, in that sense. Um, speaking of games that I didn't play, which was most of them in 2015, yeah. Brent literally just wrote all of them. Yeah, I, you know, let, let's just let's just run through a, a few that that are worth talking about. We mentioned trying three earlier. Uh, yep. I, I think we we both like Trine, and uh, we we think highly of that series. So that's definitely one that uh, that we didn't get to that that we would both like to have. Uh, Life is strange, also one that we mentioned. Uh, Rise of the Tomb Raider, obviously, uh, just because that game has not been available to us, not owning an Xbox One, but yep. uh, we will be able to play that if we choose on PC uh, early next year, since they've uh, they've recently announced that. Um, I'm going to wait and see. I'm not going to succumb to the Green Man Gaming uh, virus, but uh, I'm going to wait nope. and see how that game runs uh, out in the real world once it comes out, see what people are saying about it before dropping any coin on it. But assuming that it runs pretty well on PC, that's one I'm very likely to pick up early next year. And then, uh, oh, well, Mad Max. Obviously, you played a ton of Mad Max. Yep. I rented it from Redbox, played it a little bit, then subsequently bought it, and it's been sitting underneath uh, the case for Metal Gear Solid Five ever since uh, ever since that day. So one of these days, uh, I'll pop that in, and uh, I'll, I'll have a I'll have a rip roaring time with it. But um, that's also one I highly of it. recommend it. It's a great game. It's absolutely a great game. I had I had fun in the brief time yeah. I spent with it. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so there you go. So those are those are the best games we didn't play. There's obviously more out there, um, but those are the ones that really jumped out to us. Yeah. Um, Brent, we talked about this a little bit, but we always do the broken games category, or we do recently, which is kind of sad. <laughs> we talked about Just Cause 3. We talked yeah. about Star Wars Battlefront. Um, we didn't talk about earlier, but absolutely has to be mentioned in here, the colossal mess that was Batman Arkham Knight PC. That's probably the poster child for broken games this year. I mean, that's probably the most that's probably the most high-profile broken game that's happened in a long time. I mean, given the fact that they actually pulled it from retail sales on the, Steam. Yep. And um, and and then went back, you know, to address it. And as I understand it, still, like w- when they eventually did start reselling it, I can't remember how many like months or weeks later it was, but when they did eventually start reselling it, it still wasn't a hundred percent at that point. It still, I guess, has taken some more massaging. All right, Brent. With that, we have gotten to our top games of the year now. Brent, the way we did this last year was we had our top five of the year, yep. and then honorable mentions. Right. Um, we have continued to do that this year. Okay. Um, with a notable exception that you only actually have two games in your top five. It's hard to it's hard to have a top five when you uh, only play two games. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> it's it's challenging. It's it's very challenging. 
But uh, ultimately, like I, at first, I thought, you know what? I'm just going to uh, I'm going to give it all she's got, and uh, and I'm going to just uh, put the pedal to the metal, and the proof is in the pudding. And at the end of the day, and then like I was just doing like a bunch of DKisms, and then I I finally realized that it's really not about any of that. It's just about math. Two is less than five, and there's really nothing else to say about it. Well, there isn't much more to say, is there? No. So why don't you start, since you do have a top five, why don't you, uh, why don't you rattle off a couple of your top fives, and we'll, we'll start there. All right, Brad, I will start with my top five, and in my top five, I feel like I have to mention, and these are in no particular order right now, and if we want, we can talk about a, a top one okay. um, at the end, but in no particular order, I have to mention Rocket League. Yeah. Um, we talked about it earlier. It was a free PSN Plus game when I uh, when I initially downloaded it. I believe the purchase price was nineteen ninety nine, but I can't be sure. Okay. If you weren't a PS Plus member and on Steam, maybe it was fourteen ninety nine. I can't remember. Um, it, it, irrelevant. The game is a hundred percent worth it. Uh, I did end up giving them uh, some money. I bought a couple of the like car packs, partially because I wanted what was in them, partially because I felt like. They deserved my money because I had I really I enjoyed it that much and I wanted to su- to support the developers. Uh, Rocket League again for those of you guys that don't know it's an it's a it's an arena sports game essentially with RC cars that are playing soccer with a giant ball and it sounds ridiculous but it is colossally fun and I cannot uh, recommend it enough. I got I was fortunate enough to play uh, with some members of the Outlaw Gamer Nation. Uh, and uh, I, I just, it's just, it's just um, that that sort of s- super meat boy sort of repetitive um, loop of fun, um, but with a, a bit a different kind of skill to it. And it's just, it's a tremendous it, the, the the skill that comes with like a team sport, a tremendous amount of fun. Uh, I, I absolutely love Rocket League. I don't, I have no idea how many hours I put into it, but quite a few hours. And I still go back and we'll pick up the game and just play, you know, think, oh, I'll play a quick, you know, I, I will have not played it for weeks and I'll pick it or months even. And I'll pick it up and say, I'll play a game or two. And and out 90 minutes later, uh, I've played, you know, 15 matches in a row because yep. it's just that it's fun. Just that so, good. And uh, it's, it's already picked up a, a slew of awards, PlayStation universe, best sports game of E3. Uh, of course, the, the game awards just recently, best indie game, best sports racing game nominated for best multiplayer uh yeah it's a, yeah. it's a just a it is a fantastic fantastic game and if you, if you guys haven't had the opportunity it's just pure gameplay absolute pure gameplay uh and, and just an absolute ton of fun so uh rocket league has to be mentioned in my top five all right what else uh, another one for me brent uh that i want to talk about that i know is sort of nowhere on your list um uh, assassin's creed syndicate yeah that's true this is a surprise to me uh, this game, because uh, I never would have thought going into this year that I would be looking forward to buying an Assassin's Creed game, or that it would even make my top five uh, uh, of the year. And uh, Assassin's Creed Syndicate, a uh, gorgeous game, uh, set in um, Victorian London, which is a setting I did not think would be of, of much interest to me, but it absolutely is. Yeah. Um, beautifully rendered, gameplay is fun. They fixed a lot of the issues uh, of the of the most recent and many of the previous games. In the series, they've imp- improved the combat. They've improved the parkour. They gave you a Batman-style grapple hook uh, to improve movement across the city. Um, it feels more cohesive as a whole, a single pl- single player whole. Yeah. There's no, <laughs> I just said single player whole. Uh, <laughs> there's no, uh, <laughs> there's no <laughs> multiplayer this time around. That's an entirely um, different kind of game. The uh, the stealth aspects of the game are fleshed out a little bit and a lot more fun to play. Uh, than they have been in recent iterations of the title. I, I absolutely enjoyed it from start to finish. I'm not quite done yet, but I'm almost done. And um, I anticipate they just recently released uh, Jack the Ripper DLC for it. Which I think um, is a fantastic idea, incidentally. It is indeed, and I anticipate purchasing that. I, the only reason I haven't is because I haven't finished the game, but I yeah. would anticipate finishing the game sometime in the next month or so and, and probably purchasing that. I really enjoyed Assassin's Creed, and I think if you guys take a look around the site... Uh, and maybe in the comments of this show, you will see that uh, I, I feel like a lot of the outlaws that were on the fence about it, maybe decided to get it because I was talking about it uh, so positively. Um, I, I have not seen anyone come back and say they didn't enjoy it. I think all of the the outlaws that I have seen that picked it up that were on the fence came back and said they really, really enjoyed it. Yeah. 
it, it's one of the uh, it's one of the f- the few games that has a distinction uh, of having earned a lot of time for me watching let's plays. Uh, I, I I I did not buy the game myself, uh, and although I I have been intrigued listening to you uh, talk about it on the show, but I have watched quite a few let's plays of Assassin's Creed Syndicate, and I I have a, a love hate relationship with Assassin's Creed. I really want to like that series. And, you know, early on I, I had hang ups and, you know, I, I kind of stayed away and then I came back to it and I tried it like, yeah, this is pretty good. But then I still had hang ups and I kind of left it alone for a while again. It's one of those series that I, I legitimately want to like. I, I, I feel like there's so much there that's up my alley. And uh, I, I have watched quite a bit of Assassin's Creed Syndicate gameplay. And I don't know. It's one of those that I feel like. It's one of those games that I may very well pick up on Steam, you know, during one of the uh, the, the seasonal sales, when uh, w- when I see it for a price that that I think is is um, worthwhile, then I may very well I may very well pick that one up at some point. I don't know. You should. I'm sure, like you know, like all games on Steam, it will eventually come down. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, and I I encourage you to. It's it's uh, it's very very enjoyable. Is it's not. The most brilliant game ever made. It's a solidly made game in a really interesting environment that's beautifully rendered, and yeah. it's 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 a very enjoyable game. Yeah, the most brilliant game ever made is Metal Gear Solid Five. Anyway, um, let's move on with your list. Uh, one game that we both uh, did play, you much more so than I, but that we both enjoyed was Mad Max. Yeah, this one. This is in my top five. This is an honorable mention for you. It's in my top five, and I and I have to say it's. Also, this is a little bit surprising for me. This is one I, I wasn't necessarily that interested in, to be honest, yep. um, until very re- shortly before it came out. Um, it's not. I mean, I mean, honestly, it's. I, I, it's. I think it would be fair to say that it's fairly repetitive. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that's not in and of itself a bad thing, though. You know, I mean, th- there there have been games that I've played that that I can I can tell you, yeah, flat out repetitive. But that doesn't mean that it hasn't been fun. Yeah, and it's not. I mean, it's this is a game that that is probably one of the most beautifully rendered apocalyptic worlds I've seen in any apocalyptic world game. Right. Um, it, it, it's absolutely. You know, I said this. I said Brent when we talked about it during the course of the year that it, there was something very zen about it that I really enjoyed playing it. And it, it is this balance between it's this very beautiful desolate world with. Um, uh, very f- competent and fun combat. Yeah, it's not as good as Batman uh, combat. Um, Almost nothing is. But it's it's kind of like Shadow of Mordor was. It's good and it's solid and it's fun. Right. And um, I just enjoyed driving around the world, which is where the this beautifully rendered world comes in. The cars felt great. Yeah. Um, and it was just, it's just fun driving around. And then when you were kind of just on the verge of being bored of driving around and you get out and you do some fighting for a while, I enjoyed the fighting. And then when you get bored doing that, you just hop back in the car and go somewhere else. And it was this really nice balance between those two fundamental elements of the game, the driving and the um, and, and ranking up your car and, yeah. and, uh, and doing the light RPG stuff with your car and, uh, and, and fighting in the combat. It was a nice balance between the two. And it made for, you know, I mean, I, I have to say I probably put somewhere between, I would say, 22 and 30 hours into the game and, and enjoyed every single minute of it. I was almost never, was I frustrated or annoyed by this game. Right. It, the, it's such an important balance in, in open world games, I feel, between having, like, really engaging traversal and, and, a, reason, yep. and a reason for that traversal to happen and... And really engaging combat, but then also other things to do to to, to while away your time. Other things to to kind of get your interest, like light RPG elements that you mentioned. I find those can be really effective. Or you know, sometimes it's uh, it's you know collection quests and you know things like that. Or I say collection like collectibles, side quests, things like that. And you know, if you can if you can kind of get a balance between those three things right. Uh, I, I think I think that can make for for really compelling gameplay. And, and, it can, and Brent, that's and been, like that has been a cornerstone of what I've liked as a gamer, going back to yeah, like like Grand Theft Auto Three. You know, like playing Grand Theft Auto Three for the first time was where I really kind of like woke up to how much I like those flavors and you know, in in whatever combination. 
Yeah, it absolutely can. Um, it, and it reminds me of another one of my honorable mentions that I that I would like to bring up, and that's Dying Light. Yeah. Um, very, also did a, a good job of traversal, which in that case was parkour, yeah. uh, and combat and light RPG. Another game that was uh, early in the year uh, was surprising to me how much I enjoyed it. Really, really enjoyed Dying Light. It was really bummed, actually, that it uh, it um, I had a game save corruption or whatever, so I couldn't go back to that game because I finished. I actually... Finished Dying Light is probably the first open world game I've finished in a couple of years and was excited to go back and continue to level up my character uh, and wasn't able to because of a game save corruption, which is really unfortunate because I really, really uh, enjoyed that game. And so that made the honorable mention list for me uh, as well. I got, I, got, I got one more before we get to sort of the one that we share. All right. All right. Let's um, we'll go ahead. Which is why I'm talking about these games like they're, they're secrets. Like people don't know we're going to have The Witcher 3 on our list. <laughs> Um, so the one other one that I have on here, Brent, and, uh, again, um, I was excited about this game. Uh, it is, um, very high on my list for my top games of the year. Uh, and that is until dawn. Yeah. Uh, I really was really impressed by until dawn. I really enjoyed it. Um, one of the reasons that until dawn was so impressive to me is because I can't recall in recent memory, any game, I guess I think Batman Arkham uh, Arkham Asylum initially, the Batman series, is probably the 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 closest I would say to a game uh, that can compete with Until Dawn in its ability to manifest and capture the source material, the feeling of the source material uh, to which it is tr- trying to pay homage, mm. and that is to say that um, Until Dawn feels like. Uh, all the best, most delicious aspects of a B horror film uh, for those people that enjoy that kind of thing. It is brilliantly well done in that way. It, f- it genuinely feels to me like you are playing a B horror movie. Um, and I just, uh, I just had a tremendous, tremendous time playing that game with my wife. It, it is a game that is well suited to playing with other people. Uh, it is accessible. My wife uh, drove uh, frequently when we were when we were uh, playing the game. Mm-hmm. She was in control of the controller. Um, it was still very fun from a game standpoint, and there was a definitely a um, an aspect to that where your your sort of hand eye coordination had to work uh, at certain times. And uh, it, it was just it was a wonderful like ten hour experience. And I have every intention, and I have no doubt that we will go back and play that game at least one more time, if not more than that, because uh, there, there are so many branching differences uh, in the choices that you make and how, the, how it plays out at the end and how many people are alive uh, that there is, I think, going to be significant replayability. So uh, this game is very, very high on my list in terms of uh, games of this year. I thought it was just brilliantly brilliantly well done you know it's a really interesting game for me because i have such intense interest in the the technology that went into this game and the the specific game mechanics and it but it really really was uh a hard sell for me given the fact that it is embedded in my least favorite film genre in existence yeah and uh it it, you know it's one of those like it was just a total uphill battle for me but it's one of those games that um, I I really really love what the game represents uh, from a development standpoint and something that I want to see a lot more of. Yeah, it, it's it's it, it's it's really really well manifested. I, I don't know I don't know Brent if you would be able to get past that uh, because I'm assuming what bothers you is sort of the the, the it, insane recycling of tropes and yeah yeah it, it's, it's right it's just like the it's just like how stupid B horror movies ask you to be as an, as, yes, an, as, the, a, as a, as a viewer, that's what I can't get into. Yeah. I, I, I'm not sure if you'll be able to get past it or not. And my hope is I for you that it's, I will that like the re like if I thought I was going to be able to get past it, I'd have probably bought it at this point. I wonder. Yeah. I I'm wondering if, if it's a game you might be able to rent at some point and play for an hour or two to see, because right. part, part of, part of, what the game does is it's kind of gives that knowing wink to the genre. And so it may not bother you as much because of that. Yeah. Um, but I, I just don't, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. And, and I, 
I kind of want you to see it because of because you like games like Beyond Two Souls and Heavy Rain and that sort of thing. Because of the, um, I don't want to say I, I don't want to say necessarily that it's a forward step in terms of those controls because I think David Cage uh, did did a brilliant job, uh, especially in Heavy Rain of creating the feeling of trying to recreate what you're actually doing with your hands. Yeah. You know, the difficulty of climbing up the mud hill, that yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, that's always the example um, I think of as well. Yeah, uh, so I, I, this, it's almost like a step sort of a little bit forward and to the side. Uh, because it's not just, a, it's just, it's different from what Cage was doing. And it's not just about how you utilize the controls, but how they paired the utilization that controls, that control with decisions and, and the way the software reacts. Yeah. Um, that I think you would be interested in just from a design standpoint. Right. But anyway, big, big, uh, big ups to the team over there that created until dawn. Absolutely phenomenal. So let's, uh, let's talk about the last game. I don't know if this means it's your number one or whatever, but let's talk about the last game in your list. The, the game that we share and that is the Witcher three wild hunt. Yeah. I, I mean, so the only reason it's the last is we kind of saved it to last because it's also, it's the only game that you and I share yep. uh, on our top five list. And so, um, also I think, because you know, it's a motherfucking behemoth of awesome. Uh, it is a behemoth of awesome, Brent. It's, it's, I mean, you know, I, I don't need to tell you to, to me, I think, I think of this game as a refinement of red dead redemption. Mm. Um, and, and I, I mean, I, I feel like it takes all of the amazing systems and storytelling that red dead put into place and refines them to the point that, um, and I always go back to this example, and it's the Baron in this particular example. Yeah. But to the to the degree that I was doing a, a multiple hour side mission without knowing that it was a side mission. Yeah, it's it's interesting how almost everybody I talk to comes back to the Bloody Baron, like that. Something about that that quest line and the the sort of like the process of discovery. Uh, both of what happened and also like sort of who the Baron really is like your impression of him and how that changes over the course of that whole thing. And then, well, the, and, and the culmination, like the culmination of that mission with that, uh, I can't remember like what it's called, like the spoilers, the, yeah, the, <laughs> uh, the, yeah, the, I know the, the aborted child has become, you know, like that, that, that creature. I can't remember the name of it, but, um, yeah. the culmination of that mission is is haunting and has implications uh that are very relevant in the modern world you know i mean that that whole mission the the the, the subtext of that mission is very very relevant uh to uh that the, with just the emotional i mean the emotional stakes in what amounts to a side mission mm -hmm. it's incredible it, and like it you is said it's unbelievable it's just a side mission uh but but i think it i think it's it's i haven't finished the game uh in in fairness nor, nor have i but it's my favorite it's my favorite thing that i've done in the game so far and that is saying something you know for me the only way you can improve on this game that i like off that i've seen so far is would be to have put it in the old west right. uh, because i just have so turned on uh by that by that uh milieu yeah. in video games because it's not so explored but I, I really feel like they have just taken the amazing amazing uh work that rockstar did with red dead and and just taken another step with it and, and and to the point that i've played witcher one and two and did not love those games and i do not love these types of these types of uh of worlds necessarily i mean fantasy is tends to be my last choice right um and i think this is one of the most brilliant games ever made i agree with you 100 percent. i i think that i think the the witcher three you're talking about it in terms of a refinement of red dead redemption and i i and, and I, I understand the way that you mean that, but in a sense, like it's it's almost not giving it enough credit for what it is. And I was thinking that as I was saying it, I don't I don't mean to detract from the creators of that by saying they're copying. Yeah, w w which they're they're clearly not. But I, I think that there is. I think that they looked at, at at Red Dead Redemption and said, "Wow, you know, there's a lot of things of that that you know we could really bring into our world and make them make them our own and make them really really amazing." And I think that they've done that. The the thing about The Witcher Three for me is, I have I have like an interesting relationship with RPGs in that, um, when when I find one that really suits my sensibilities, there's almost nothing that I love more, and 
And, and that's one of the reasons that I love Red Dead so much, even though ostensibly it's not an RPG in that there's not really, you know, like, like that kind of leveling of attributes and things like that you right. normally associate with that. But it is that it is that feeling of that if that feeling of immersion inhabiting a world, a character, a place and time, a situation or series of situations that that just you can totally dive into for you know however long you're playing and uh, and I find that so satisfying and The Witcher absolutely satisfies on that in addition to the. The, the traditional kind of RPG stuff that, that that game is doing. And when I first started playing it, I was rather intimidated by the the rpg edness of it all. And I, I kind of... I, I slacked off. Like I, I started playing it and then stopped for a little while because I wasn't really having fun with it. And when I came back to it, I really just had to so, sort of surrender and say, all right, look, I'm just going to have to play this game the way it's meant to be played. And it's meant to be played as an RPG. And that means I've got to dive in and start, you know, looking at all of the, you know, the oils for the blades and all of the the Witcher tech that you have to craft and dealing with monsters and and actually reading the bestiary uh, about what sorts of tactics and potions to and use, things like yeah. that. And at, and but the thing is, once I just did that stuff, I loved it. I loved how strategic I I I felt in. In, in playing the game on on that level and uh, and all that and you know RPGs are intimidating in terms of the uh, in terms of the time that that it, it it takes to to really invest in one you know uh, one of our listeners uh, John Carter uh, he he's he uh, is doing a, a podcast himself now called uh, uh, Hardly Casual and they were he he and his uh, co-host were talking about you know just like that whole intimidation factor in getting into an RPG like knowing. It's going to take like minimum maybe like thirty or forty hours of your life to get through it, and you know like what where's the point where you kind of say, "Okay, I'm diving in for thirty or forty hours worth, and that was a hard thing for me with The Witcher because I don't have like so much time now, but man, it was so i mean it's been so worth it, I'm not even through it yet, you know that yeah. game was such a worthwhile use of my time. Indeed, I, I agree a hundred percent. It's just a, just an an absolutely amazing, amazingly well done game, and um, CD Projekt Red deserves a tremendous amount of praise for that game. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, uh, the, I th- I think al- although it's maybe not the one that I picked, uh, the you know the Game Awards 2015 handed them Game of the Year for The Witcher Three, and I, I mean I don't have anything to say in protest, you know. Yep. Yep. Indeed. All right. So. Brent, that leaves us one last game, which is uh, the only other game that you play, which isn't true. There's, we have a couple of honorable mentions left for both you and me, and you did touch some other games, but, yeah. but significantly well, listen, listen, played. I've, I've, touched, I've touched more than some other games. I mean, <laughs> come on, give us um, credit here. Metal Gear Solid Five. Uh, you know, uh, let's let's do the honorable mentions, and, and then we'll come back to Metal Gear Solid Five. Okay. Um, because uh, one of the, I, you know, I didn't really have a lot, a lot to say on Mad Max because I didn't play it that much, but I do have Mad Max in my honorable mentions list because for the brief amount of time I did play it, I, I really enjoyed playing Mad Max. And it's one of those games that I really want to get back to because it's, it's a very, it's, it is a very different kind of experience from, you know, a Witcher or a Metal Gear or anything like that in that I feel like playing Mad Max I can do on a much more casual basis. And but still have a really really great time with, and plus I yep, just I I just love Mad Max and the lore, and 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 you know and everything that that game sort of represents, uh, you know being a herald of this long standing film franchise, which despite Mel Gibson being a lunatic, uh, I, I still deeply deeply love and and have such enormous respect for what it represents in cinema. Indeed, it's it's a fantastic game. It's absolutely fantastic. You have a couple more games in your honorable mention. Well, yeah, uh, you know, Transformers Devastation is one that uh, is one that I I red boxed and played, and I had a fantastic time with. And you know, I said at the time, like I definitely want to get this when it's a little bit cheaper, and I think it's worth holding off on. You know, I've heard people say that it's it's a fun game, but it repetitive. Like we were talking about earlier, you know, it's a fun game, but it does get same old, same old pretty fast, and. You know, I, I can I can be okay with that, but it's it's one of those games that I'm just I'm going to hold off on on getting given that that's the case. But I loved 
I loved absolutely what that game represented in terms of this really the the meld of that style of a, of action gameplay and and the combat stuff in infused with the my favorite era in in the Transformers lineage the the G1 stuff which uh, I'm happy to say is kind of having a resurgence right now which is great for me since that's that's uh, what I'm all about so that that game was that game was a lot of fun and then you know just a bunch of mobile stuff I mean it didn't come out this year but obviously I played tons of Star Wars Commander which uh, which I love and then uh, and then Laura Croft Go which is a follow up to a follow up to Hitman Go one of my favorite mobile games that I've ever played and then Fallout Shelter, which I mean, I just can't even describe to you. I can't even describe to you how much I love Fallout Shelter. That the, the announcement of that game during Bethesda's E3 event, and and then you know going and downloading it and playing it, and the way that just all the ways that it it really does tie to Fallout and and has some of the same ideas and and of course a lot of the same sort of humor and tone and everything. I, I think Fallout Shelter is one of the best mobile games that's ever been made. If not the, it's fantastic. And speaking of Fallout, Brent, that's the one other game. You know, I mentioned Battlefront and Just Cause 3 were in my honorable mentions, and they are. They just also, I wish I could play them. Um, (laughs) Dying Light, we talked about the other game, though. Speaking of Fallout, that's in my honorable mentions is Fallout 4. Big Daddy. Um, Which is is interesting that a game like Fallout 4 uh, is in my honorable mentions, not in my top five, and not even on your list. Well, I haven't played Um, it, so that's... No, no, but I'm saying, like, in a year, one thing that's interesting about this year that I've noticed, Brent, before uh, we finish up our top games of the year, one yeah. of the things that I've noticed is the list, the sort of master list of games, feels a little bit smaller than maybe in years past. Right. Um, and um, I, I don't know, it, 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 it felt smaller than I anticipated it would be. However, there are some, when you talk about, like, game of the year, the fact that The Witcher 3, Metal Gear Solid 5, and Fallout 4 are all potent- are all part of that discussion in the same year is uh, astonishing. It's it's significant. Those are those are some big 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 heavy hitters all coming out yeah. sort of right at the same time. So, uh, Fallout 4 in my honorable mention, I'm only, you know, 15 plus hours into it. Um, so there are definitely frustrating things about it, but it is also very very enjoyable and somewhat addictive. Uh, so in my honorable mention, Brent, and that it covers all of the games in our uh, top games of the year with one last exception, Brent. Which, of course, uh, is is the greatest game that has ever been made, which is Metal Gear Solid 5. Red Dead Redemption. Oh. Phantom Pain. Um, the Phantom Menace? The, you wish. <laughs> you wish you could hate on it that easily. No, I don't want to crap on your love. Um, Metal Gear Solid. Just your chest. Metal Gear Solid 5. <laughs> 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 Sorry, did I throw you off there, Brent? That's fucking hysterical. Um, <laughs> but anyway, did you ever finish Danger Five? No, no, I couldn't get uh, into it. All right, well, the, the, then I've got a joke that, that won't work. But anyway, um, <laughs> Metal Gear Solid Five is a really interesting game for me in that I have a a troubled history with the Metal Gear series. The original Metal Gear on the NES is one of those, it, it's one of those, like, oh shit gaming moments of, of my early gaming career. Like, playing the original Metal Gear and and kind of figuring out how deep the game mechanics were compared to its contemporaries. It, it was a really, really big deal when I was a kid. And then, many years later, playing Metal Gear Solid on the PlayStation and the amazing experience that that game represented but both both just purely as a game experience but also sort of the the culture of game experience that it represented between uh, me Tony and Daniel that game was a really really important bonding experience in our friendship uh and just everything that kind of happened with it and and then you know like i i had you know trouble with the franchise over the years you know like i was really resentful over the the uh, change in direction in Metal Gear Solid 2, the introduction of this uh, this inferior character Raiden, and, uh, and and all of that stuff, and, and and you know feeling like Kojima had created this this character Solid Snake, and then basically was just trying to figure out ways to not make games involving this character. And I really I really was resentful over that. And so subsequently, I never felt like I never really got into uh, Big Boss as as a character in the subsequent games uh, snake eater and and so forth 
Um, so Metal Gear Solid Five for me is interesting in that I came into the game lured by the promise of Metal Gear style stealth action combined with open world, which I love open world games as a general rule. So it just seemed like this was one I could not pass up. And it's interesting because it's not really an open world game. It's a sandbox game, but it's not, you know, like a living, breathing open world the way like Red Dead or The right. Witcher is. You know, it's not that style of game. And yet, I'm not disappointed by that, you know? And it doesn't, it doesn't star Solid Snake, who was always my favorite character, and yet, I'm not disappointed by that. And it doesn't really have cohesive storytelling and, and, and the big, epic, sort of cinematic tale that the other games have, and yet I am not disappointed by that. What the game has is, I think, the most profound gameplay experience I've ever had in my life. It is a game whose depth I continually find myself amazed by, and I am constantly, I'm constantly underestimating, thinking, okay, well, I've, I've pretty much experienced about everything that the game has to offer, and then there's some little door... There's some window or something that I, I peek through and realize there is a whole other there's a whole other level of gameplay that is available to me. And then I, I dive into that, and then it happens again and again. And I've talked about on the show about layers of an onion and how just when you think you've got Metal Gear figured out, there's something else there to discover. There's some new angle on gameplay to enjoy. There's some there's there's some, you know, like hidden secret. That you haven't uh, you haven't figured out yet that you can go off and and uh, and explore, and just the 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 gameplay being what it is, this this emphasis on stealth and tactics, and there there is uh, to a degree there's a I guess you could argue there's maybe a light RPG component within the crafting and being able to uh, to develop certain weapons and right. things like that you know to outfit your your kit and your companions but, uh, and that it, sort of thing. Yeah, right. exactly. But um it's just I don't know. I mean, I'm not telling you that I'm not telling you that this game in any way takes away from or, you know, destabilizes like Red Dead Redemption as an example as like, you know, my top game of all time. I I was actually quite curious about that because it sounds like what you're describing is you said is the best gameplay experience you've ever had, but it is. And, and it, I it think you will say uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Brent, but is is this your game of the year? Yes, unquestionably this, this game game of the year. Of, I mean there's not even there's nothing else that right, even so comes I'm close, curious I know? was curious to know like relative to say a Red Dead Redemption which is probably one of the most profound emotional experiences you've had playing a yes. game in conjunction with amazing game players that sort of thing does it unseat yeah. Red Dead no it, it, it doesn't unseat Red Dead because I I do not I do not think that the story well I mean I say I don't think the story does not engage me the way that the story of Red Dead Redemption did. But the the gameplay and the the sort of endless ability to play the game uh and and to cha- and, and to create new new gameplay experiences through your actions, through the weapons you decide to take with you, uh and, and those kinds of things. The fact that it is just this sort of infinite sandbox of stealth action gameplay which I absolutely love. I mean, like, I can't think, I cannot think of any other game in my life that I've played that I think about when I'm not playing it. I think about it. I dream about it. I wake up and think, Oh, you know, I bet I could, I bet I could do this. I bet I could, uh, you know, attack this, this, uh, this outpost and, and come in from this direction and do this. It just, something about this game is everything I have ever wanted to play in a game, it does almost nothing in terms of story. Although I will say that it it actually has given me an appreciation for Big Boss as a character, which is highly ironic given the ending of the game. But um, it's given me an appreciation for Big Boss as a character that I never had. It, it, it's made me really, really understand what is so great about that character, even though it's the least story-driven Metal Gear that's ever been made. Probably. Right, I'm curious... You know, while you were sort of talking about it and comparing it to, say, Red Dead Redemption, I was thinking to myself, so what if what if they took this level of gameplay and married it with 
the the story, uh, the astounding story of of Red Dead Redemption. And and then I actually kind of thought to myself, stopped yeah. for a moment and, and thought and wanted to ask you the question: Do you think would that even be possible? Do you think that a game like Metal Gear Solid that is so purely about the gameplay and trying it methodically and in different ways, and if you if you die, you start over because you wanted to get just right, and you try with different weapons? Yeah. Do you think that would actually? Do you think that style of gameplay would allow for an would emotionally it, would it work for a story yeah. in which you could emotionally invest, or would that just break up the pacing? So much do you think that it would, uh, it, it just that you probably couldn't pair those two things together in that way to that degree? It's a really, I've thought about this and it's a really interesting question. And I have to say that I'm, I'm, I'm a little skeptical. I'm a little unsure as to whether or not you could have the, the gameplay focused experience that this game is. And it is a gameplay focused game. Um, I don't know if you could have that experience and marry it with a really story-driven game like Red Dead, and 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 have it. Uh, I I don't know that I I don't want to say like it wouldn't be as good. It would just be different. It would just be something different. But uh, having said that, if anybody wants to give it a try, I'd yeah, love to play that right, game. Right. But anyway, yeah, Metal Gear Solid Five is 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 my game of the year, two thousand and fifteen. And while it's not my favorite game of all time, because I do crave. I really crave great, great storytelling in games, and this this game does actually have some pretty some pretty interesting and pretty good storytelling, but it's the kind of storytelling that relies upon you doing a lot of work and I don't just mean you know, going through the list and listening to all the audio tapes. it involves you thinking about what's going on and analyzing the information you're given and making some leaps of imagination yourself to kind of get to the end. And so I, I did not have the profound emotional reaction at the end of this game that I did uh, a Red Dead Redemption, but the journey along the way, the joy of playing this game and experiencing the game mechanics and, and just playing with all of that stuff in that sandbox, that is an experience that I've only had maybe three times in my life up until now it will go up there you know with these games that i i literally like i can literally divide up like sections of like my gaming career like my gaming career will be divided into like pre and post metal gear solid 5 it's changed fundamentally my appreciation expectations uh and notions of what games can be it, it really has been a profound experience that is extremely profound brent um uh, that, that that's incredible and, and i actually i feel similarly to my game of the year which is in fact witcher 3 um i, right. I do i i do have to say that i i thought even down to today was thinking about um the possibility of until dawn being my game of the year because i, I again i think it's uh, almost never have i seen an equitable representation of what a game is trying to pay homage to um at, at a level of quality that i think until dawn uh, paid to its genre of gaming, um, and, and so I seriously, right. seriously considered it for my game of the year, even with The Witcher Three. Um, but at, at the end, that's that's pretty high praise. It, 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 it is, and I, I believe the game deserves it. But um, at the end of the day, I think The Witcher Three, uh, up to this point, and I do intend to finish that game, uh, has and potentially um, has to some degree, and potentially once I am done playing it might to a more significant degree change my expectations of, of what I want from a gaming experience uh, because I think it is so profoundly um, prolific in its quality uh, relative to storytelling, uh, the way Metal Gear Solid sounds like it is to gameplay uh, for you. So um, yeah. two, two amazing, amazing games. That's a good analogy. Uh, um, Honestly, I mean, like the two of these games coming out this year, I mean, the only thing that stopped me from playing The Witcher 3, the only thing that could have stopped me, was Metal Gear Solid yep. Five? You know yeah. the the fact that the fact that we've been able to experience both of these games this year is uh, is something I'm very thankful for as a gamer. All right, uh, so those are our games of the year for 2015. Um, probably no shock, some of them. Others might be surprising. Let's talk about Brent. Our most anticipated games for the year 2016. All right, well, well, let's do it. Uh, we sh we have a lot of overlap here, although it might be instructive to. It might be instructive to talk about how many of our most anticipated games for 2016 
were also our most anticipated games for 2015. Yes, that's right. We talked about how No Man's Sky and Uncharted 4, uh, both of which yeah. are on yours and my most anticipated list for 2016, yeah. uh, were also there for 2015. Um, yeah. For Uncharted 4, Rise of the Tomb Raider. We Rise of the Tomb Raider, earlier. that's correct. Um, uh, yeah. We also talked about the fact that Tom Clancy's The, the Division is not on our list of most anticipated anymore. Uh-huh. Um, I'm I'm done. I'm so, done with that. I, I, <laughs> there's just there's just there's just no reason. Maybe to get maybe we'll be pleasantly surprised, point. but I ain't holding my breath. Um, All right. So some other games, Brent. For you, XCOM Two. That is a big one. I mean, honestly, Uncharted Four and XCOM Two. You know, they're such different games. But I, I'm telling you, like like those. When I think about what I'm not playing right now and what I'd really like to be, those are the two games that that I'm that I think of. Yeah, you know, uh, honestly, Brett, the one that I sort of, when I think about what I'm not playing right now and want to be, and this may come as a surprise to you, and I'm very, very pleased that they have announced a release date of February 9th, Unravel uh, is a game that I just, I I am so looking forward to this game. It looks fantastic. I I remember that when I saw the trailer for that game, I thought of you, I said, man, I can't wait for Lauren to see this, because I, I just I had a feeling that that game was really going to be in your yeah, wheelhouse. Yeah, I'm very, very excited for that game. So another one I'm excited for, Brent, although um, I still am cautiously optimistic about it, is Horizon Zero Dawn. Uh, that yeah, was a nice yeah. surprise this year, and I'm looking forward to hopefully it coming out this year, if not uh, getting more information about it, but right now it's slated for this year. Um, another one for you, Brent, Deus Ex Mankind Divided. I love Deus Ex. Uh, Human Revolution. That game was, um, man, that that game was such a, a fantastic experience and, and and a sandbox experience in its own way. Uh, you know, similar to like what we were talking about with Metal Gear Solid Five. And I'm really, really anxious to play the uh, the follow up. Yes, another one, Brent, that uh, that you have on your list, which is not on my list. Uh, I think mostly based on uh, the last uh, iteration in this series, the new Hitman game. Yeah, I'm very, very curious about the new Hitman. I like what I've seen, uh, that the, you know, what I've seen of the, of the gameplay they've shown off so shown off so far. Uh, but that's definitely one that that I, I'm taking a look at again. You know, I love, uh, you know, I, as as I'm talking about this, like I can kind of see, you know, like where a lot of my interest converges. Uh, you know, in in keywords like sandbox, strategy, uh, tactics, and, and and freedom of choice. You know, within within uh, whatever the sandbox constraints are. And uh, you know, and that's what Hitman purports to be. Whether or not it succeeds, I don't know. But uh, they they've definitely have my interest on the the goals that they've set for for their game mechanics. Yeah, another one, Brent, that you and I are uh, very both very interested in, and this is fairly high on my list too, Brent. They just came out with some more gameplay for this Firewatch, dude. Every time I see Firewatch, I I get more excited. I, Which I, is literally the, the so far what we've seen is like a park ranger roaming around. Yeah. Exactly. The mountains of Colorado it's is the, essentially what we've seen. It's the most unlikely game to really be excited about, and yet it, it it in no way stops me from being excited about that game. Something about the tone of that game and the <clears throat> the mystery the the, the mystery of, of of what is kind of going on that they they they've hinted at a bit. There's just something about that that I find enormously compelling. I, I agree tremendously, and we're going to talk about it more on the first show of the next year. They came out with, I think it's 17 more minutes or something of gameplay. Uh, that we'll talk yeah. about a little in the first uh, first week of next year's show. Looks very interesting. And then, Brent, sort of the last one that you and I really put up there as sort of things we're most uh, anticipating, and we both have this on our list, uh, is the upcoming Mafia 3. Yeah, man, I'll, I'm all about it. Yeah. Yep. I, 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 again, we'll talk about this in the first week of next year. There's some more footage came out. Um, yeah. Very, very excited for it. Love Mafia 2. Really liking what I'm seeing for Mafia 3. Very excited about that. Um and let's see, we've got some, I, like, I don't know, like, I don't know how excited about these you are. Like, I consider some of these some honorable yeah. mention stuff, but let's go ahead and go through them. Mirror's mm-hmm. Edge Catalyst, really, really anxious to see what, what how that shapes up. Last Guardian. That, that, that's only an honorable I mean, mention for me, because I don't believe it. <laughs> it. It has been a long time coming. It has been a very, very long time coming, that game. Uh, Mass Effect Andromeda, which I, I am, I am very curious about. I, I like the Mass Effect series overall. Uh, I, I liked it more when it was a little bit more RPG focused than when it became a little bit more action adventure focused, but, uh, but I, I do like mass effect quite a bit and I'm, I'm curious to see 
how the sort of the second chapter, I guess, sort of shapes up. Uh, Dishonored two. I I never made it very far into the first Dishonored. Uh, so is is this one that you're more? No, actually, at? it it's not. I put this on here because um, I I think it's one our listeners will be taking a look at. I mean, I think Dishonored was yeah. a game that was that was very highly regarded uh, by most people, and it was just what you know. It, it's akin to. So I, even though I didn't like The Last of Us, I would put The Last of Us Two on here because I know what it meant to every to to much of the, our the gaming audience, and I I think Dishonored Two yeah. falls into that category. While I didn't love Dishonored, uh, I think much of the gaming audience absolutely loved it, and so I think I feel like Dishonored Two is going to be a big one for for our listeners. Yeah, that, that's undoubtedly true. Uh, and then we got Recore, which uh, is a game that uh, we've covered on the show before, haven't we? We've talked about Recore. Yes, we have. Uh, Recore is a game, is an action adventure game coming from uh, uh, Kenji Inafune, and, and uh, I, I think is one that again, um, m- much of the audience, myself included, are going to be interested in coming in in uh, 2016. And while it doesn't sort of top my list, I'm very interested to see more information on it. And again, hopefully, it comes out. Yeah, th- I, th- that's a, that's a fair evaluation of uh, of my feelings on it as well. And then I guess the uh, I guess the last game that that we'll mention is is a a game that is not just highly anticipated by you and I, but basically the entire fucking planet. Uh, and that is No Man's Sky, which, uh, as of right now, they say is going to be out June 2016. And, you know, the hype train has been rolling on this game basically since they er- ever since they showed it off at, I guess, the 2014, was it the VGX, I think? And I, I tell you, it's been a really, really interesting journey with this game, sort of delving into what the game is, what the game isn't, and, and all, of the, all of the things that, that the game kind of represents in terms of technology and, and em- emergent gameplay, emergent narrative, and things like that. It, it's, a, it's another one of those games that I'm very, very interested in, sort of for what it represents from a technological standpoint, and how these kinds of game systems are going to shape future games. It's, it's one of those things that I am really, really interested to see how will they execute all of the all of the, the game mechanics that they are uh, advertising right now? But definitely uh, on the most anticipated list for next year. Indeed. All right, Brent. Uh, we'll be we'll have to wait and see how many of those games end up on our most anticipated of 2017, <laughs> uh, which I'm sure some of them will. It'll be more than a couple. I have I a feeling as well. Uh, and with that, my friend, I believe we've reached the end of the game of the year episode for. 2015 some great games this year a uh, wonderful year in gaming was it was it a good game was it a good year for to i be think a gamer, it was Lauren? was 2015 a good I, year? I think it was i mean i think there were some just huge huge heavy hitters like we talked about metagill solid and and um yeah fallout 4 and the witcher 3 uh some other great games that we uh all enjoyed and i think next year we're going to get some more great games and hopefully some more great game announcements red dead redemption 2 so yeah, well, we'll keep our fingers crossed yeah, that on that. Will. Uh, all right, Brent, I think we'll uh, wrap on the year. As usual, we want to hear what you guys have to say about everything we talked about. I'm not going to run through the entire list of games because it's quite a long one, but please do pipe in on all the categories we talked about, whether it was a remasters or indie games or what you wish would have come out. Your most disappointing, the best games you didn't play, broken games, uh, and, of course, any of the games we talked about in our top games of the year and the most anticipated for 2016. We want to hear what you guys Think about all of those things. From Brent and I, we both wish you all a happy holidays. For those of you that already had them, we hope they were good. For those of you that have them upcoming, we hope you have a good holidays and a happy and healthy new year to everybody. We will be back in the first week of January of 2016 for a new episode of Outlaw Gamer Radio. As usual, he is Brent Adams and I am Lauren Baumgarten. And remember, you don't stop playing because you get old. You get old because you stop playing.